Hello gardeners, thank you so much for watching and we're happy to be here and talking about plants and all kinds of things in the out of doors and indoors as well. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the horticulture area, but in the crop sciences department. So I'll answer questions about perennials and cut flowers, but we have three talented folks right here with me. Let's find out who they are, their area of expertise, and they're gonna do some either show and tell or email. So I'm gonna start first with you, Dave Plussard. Hi, Dave. Hi, Diane, thank you. I'm the garden center manager at Hare Nursery in Peoria, and my specialty is landscaping uh, trees. I'm a certified arborist as well. So what I brought in today was uh, plants that have winter burn, or technical term would be winter desiccation, but this is uh, dwarf Alberta spruce, a very common uh, plant that people use, and you can see the browning that's on it, and that's caused by the plant losing more moisture in the winter than it's actually able to take up. We also have example of a boxwood, very similar situation where the plant just plain dried out because there was too much wind, maybe too much sun, and that causes it to dry out and not able to uh, retain its color and it, that part of it dies. But if you look at this same boxwood, thank you, Karen, um, I'm not sure if it's quite obvious, but the top is, is browning and the bottom part is green. So on some of these plants, if you open them up and look in the center of them, you will see that they are nice and green. And therefore, most of them, you can just trim off what is burned, or in other words, the part of it that has died. This is a yew, which is also an extremely common plant. I don't think the white paper probably helps it a whole lot here, but you can see again that it has browning and it's, uh, again, just needs to be cut out. And if you look at the center of the yews, they generally are doing very well. The uh, last sample I have is, this is a white pine and you can see on this, hopefully, the uh, needles are some of them, it's just the tips of the needles. Some of it's all the needles. And you'll see trees that almost all look brown because the needles are all uh, desiccated or dried out. And very often, the buds of the trees, which you can't see in the specimen, but a lot of these plants, the buds are still healthy. And so the plants are going to continue to grow and they will be fine. So a lot of the calls that we get about these, um, what can I do with them? Are they going to die? Uh, what should be done, and in some cases, you're just going to have to trim off the plant, like the boxwood you just and the yew, you just trim off what is dead. Most of these will recover just fine. The uh, dwarf Alberta spruce will grow out of it, and the pine will also grow out of it. So not all of them have to be trimmed back, but in most cases, the plants will be fine unless, uh, if you don't see any new growth coming out this spring, of course, then you know you'll have to replace the plant. I've seen some Douglas firs that just look brown, but yeah. hopefully it's going to grow out of it. So mm -hmm. thank you. I think that helps people to reassure it's nothing they could have done. It, and it's, it's, it's widespread. Mm -hmm. So you will see it all over central Illinois. Yeah. And probably mid-America, yes. I would say. Yeah, really. And, and some of it's even caused by salt spray from mm -hmm. the roads. So it can be caused by a lot of different things, but it's from the winter, kind of dries out the cells of the plant, but they recover. Okay, very good, thanks Dave. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna go to the one in the middle and that is Karen Ruckles. Hi Karen. Hi, uh, I work at Hair Nursery in Peoria and um, I don't know that I really have an expertise area but I like houseplants, perennials, shrubs. Um, so tonight um, I have a rubber plant question that um, Maxine had sent in and hopefully we can help you with this. It, she had a, a rubber plant that she purchased, has it in a bright room, but she's having a couple issues. Some of the leaves are turning yellow and they're starting to dry and fall off. And then most of the leaves have these small pimply white on them. Now talking about the, the dropping leaves, um, that is probably because a rubber plant, the older leaves will fall off and, and you will lose them unfortunately. The other thing that could have happened is make sure that the plant has well is well drained. They don't like to stay too wet. And also that you transplanted it going up into a bigger pot. Hopefully it was just maybe two inches bigger than the pot it was in. 
because they, they really, they like to be root bound and for a number of years are very tolerant of sitting in the same pot and they'll be fine typically. The, the, you'd sent in a, a great picture of the leaf and these white pimple dots on it. Those are actually fine and nothing to worry about. The thing I was a little bit worried about your picture is it almost looked like there was a stickiness on that leaf mm -hmm. and that concerns me that you might have an insect problem and unfortunately with how long ago you sent in this email it could be um, pretty bad at this point. But look on the undersides of your leaves, look for webbing of spider mites or look for scale insects. Um, they're a little, they're actually a, a kind of a dot but a bigger dot usually will be brown and kind of domed and they have they'll, they'll eat and and they'll have a stickiness that that will leave on your leaves so you want to look for an insect problem is probably what I would worry most about for you but um, the older leaves will fall off not too big of a deal okay very good thank you Karen and now I'm going to turn it over to you Ella Maxwell well, thank you. You're I'm welcome. at Hair Nursery as well. I'm a horticulturist there. And I brought a show and share because I think we can't forget mom with an Easter basket or a May basket. So I made a little basket here with um, some beautiful plants. So you can visit the nursery. I added basil because that would be great for mm -hmm. the kitchen garden. And then some uh, little annuals, a uh, little calibrachoa here. And of course, you know, you can use the Easter grass, the Easter basket, some little uh, plastic eggs and enjoy that. And then of course there's always little things to tuck in. And I, I just love bunnies. I collect bunnies. And so oh. here was uh, a little decoration, but maybe more practical is mom always loves gloves and Ella always <laughs> loves gloves. And everyone gloves. on this table. <laughs> yeah, that's this right. Table. That's right. So think about this, doing something special for mom and uh, she'll really appreciate her holidays. Very cute. Thank you, Ella. I do like these gloves and look how <laughs> attractive those go together so thanks so much you bet well we're going to go to a special did you know right now remember reading La Tulip Noire in French class in high school, the black tulip. And when you look at a black tulip or any black flower, it really does look dark, dark, mm -hmm. dark, dark purple. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's not. It, that's why we found out there's no true black. But keep working, everyone who's working on that. So La Tulip Noire, how did I do? <laughs> that was from a few years ago, French <laughs> class. All right, let's go to the phone lines, and we have a call from Edward, and it's about mulch on line one. Hi, Edward. Hi there. And what's your question? My wife believes that all mulch should be changed at, at the end of the winter, and I think it can probably stay, and I haven't got a clue what the right answer is. Next question is we have a lot of hostas. What type mulch is best for them? Well, let's start with the first uh, question about should mulch be changed and we might have different answers I don't know but who wants to dig in do you change your mulch or do you leave it and add I leave mine um, I leave mine and add yeah. Karen I, I leave it and add I mean Ella yes and and I was going to talk more about that with one of my oh, emails good. okay so, so yes. let's just stop with leave it and add so then I don't ever change my convince her to keep the mulch and uh, Edward, you can go ahead and have it um, kind of fluff it back up and if you need to add a little bit more, but as it breaks down, it'll add nutrients to the soil surface and uh, also it uh, just helps to enrich the soil. And um, Yeah, the worms will actually come up, take the mulch down so that it, it improves the soil and helps uh, the, well, the worms will eat what they need and then they'll fertilize with their worm droppings or what do they call Castings. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, now, and, and for the hosta. For, I was going to say hosta question. I, I would say mulch. the hosta really don't mind. 
I, I, the hosta don't even really have to have mulch. It just makes it look prettier. Now, some people feel that in years that are more moist and wet, that mm -hmm. then you're going to have more of a slug problem the more you add uh, a humid, damp environment. I say mulch is pretty, um, <laughs> you know, but it, it, the hosta aren't picky. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there is two f schools of thought on hosta, so mm -hmm. it just depends on how many slugs you have in your garden. Yeah, <laughs> but true. I think mulch does add so much water holding that it's, you almost do want to have that. Controls weeds. And it controls weeds, exactly. And it improves the soil. So mm -hmm. I often say mulch is my middle name, but I've got to not say that because it's really not true. <laughs> okay, but I do like mulch. All right, let's, uh, thank you very much, Edward, for that question. Hope we helped you. And then let's move on to line two. And Phyllis has a red sunset maple question. Hi, Phyllis. Hi. We just planted a uh, five to six inch red sunset maple last fall, and mm -hmm. the trunk was already covered for the winter protection. And when we uncovered it a few weeks ago, we noticed at the bottom, um, straight up the trunk, about 24 inches up high, uh, there's a slit in the trunk that's about three quarters inch at the bottom, and it gradually gets up to about a half inch at the top. And we just wondered, is there any kind of treatment we need to do to that? Did you mention what side of the trunk it was on? It's on the north side. Okay. Mr. Arborist, or, or no, that's well, right. uh, when it comes to is there anything I can do for it, the answer is no. Is no. Um, the best thing to do is to keep the tree growing as well as you can. You can certainly uh, fertilize the tree, keep it watered, mulch the tree is very important. Did you say and what it was caused from? The probably so a frost oh, crack. Yeah. No, I didn't. I'm yeah, because I think she might want to know that okay. as well. Well, that and frost cat crack is caused when the sun keeps up the west or the south side of the bark and the north side is cooler and the temperature can drop quickly in the winter time. The side that is heated up doesn't uh, contract quite as much as what's on the north side and that causes a splitting and opening of the bark. Now you had said that it was covered during the winter, which uh, normally that is the way to prevent it, but unfortunately that's not 100% uh, prevention. So in your case, that is what happened. Well, and, so, and w with red maples, how quickly they grow, she should probably even see this summer that beginning healing and it. it's a kind of a lumping yes. along mm -hmm. there. And that's a very good sign that that, that wound is going to heal over and probably in what, a year, two years? Won't it even can heal over. Uh, occasionally, I will see one reopen later, but um, in a lot of cases, they do heal over. So nothing really to be concerned about Right. And it could happen on other trees. It's not just maples. So, so I think you'll be just fine. Good. Thank you for answering that question. And now um, on line three, Carol has a question about arborvitae. Line three. Hi, Carol. Hi. Uh, I have arborvitae that are 15 feet to 25 feet. And it goes with what you were talking about earlier. They're very brown. Mm -hmm. If I would cut out the brown, I would lose about 80% of the trees. I've put on fertilizer that I've used for holly and hydrangeas, and I don't know what else I can do. Well, you're, you're doing as much as you can do. Uh, you can trim out. Uh, if you want to wait and see if any of the branches produce buds and new growth to replace them. Uh, maybe you don't want to do that severe pruning until you see if the tree itself or the arborvitae themselves are able to recover from that. Because once you cut in and you remove into what's called the dead wood in the center, it's not really dead, but it's called that because there's no foliage, then if you start trimming your arborvitae back into that center dead area that won't grow out, uh, then it, it's too severe and you probably uh, are not going to be able to save them. So the first thing I would do, you've already taken care of them by fertilizing them. Again, I would probably just give it some time and it's going with it's such a, a long spring, winter, where things are not really happening yet, I would go ahead and I'd wait till middle of May or so. And then you'll have to decide whether you, what you can cut out. Okay. Well, and I, I think always a good rule of thumb, too, is come middle of May, cut out what definitely never grow, grew, mm -hmm. and then look at it and say, can I live with this for a couple of years to see if it can grow out, or is it too horrible looking 
and yeah, and potential on plants is always the key. And right. arborvitae, unfortunately, are not quite like uh, some of the others in terms of recovery when you have very severe damage. So again, with the arborvitae, I would do a kind of wait and see. And as Karen pointed out, what is the potential of the plant going to be? This was just a very interesting winter. It was a it was a winter. And and arborvitaes are a drought indicator plant, so they mm -hmm. suffered a lot from last year's mm -hmm. uh, conditions, mm -hmm. and this winter didn't cut them any slack. Because it was frozen, they, lose, they couldn't take up they moisture. They do lose the brown. The brown should fall out. If the brown doesn't fall out, then the branch is dead. If the branch is healthy, those little branchlets will fall out. Mm -hmm. So there is hope. That's great. <laughs> well, we're going to do another round of emails or show and tell, whichever you might want to. So Dave, okay. you want to start? Sure. My uh, email is from Betty Dedman in Longview, Illinois. It's a little bit lengthy, so bear with me. I need help with my 2014 fruit tree pruning. I have three apple trees, two peach trees, two Montmorency cherry trees, and one Bartlett pear tree. I had no fruit in 2012, but remember the freeze and then the drought? I finally pruned them all first time early March 2013, and most of the trees flourished. Good thing, that's what you should do. One peach tree and one golden delicious apple tree are really old and I am worried that my neglect may have permanently harmed them. The old peach tree is half the size it was in 2012, but it looks really healthy with the numerous winter buds and it produced a ton of peaches last year, so much so that three limbs broke late summer. This old golden delicious apple is quarter the size of its 2012 size. Several large limbs died from the drought. I pruned them off last spring and still it produced a lot of apples last year, but it broke three small limbs from the weight. Right now it has one small dead limb, but there are buds where it overhangs my tool shed. However, I'm wondering if it is dying, how would you go about pruning the apple tree and the peach tree? It has been so cold, I'm not so sure about that. I DVR your show, and if you could keep us all updated about when this really cold winter would be best, uh, that would help. Thank you very much. Love your show, and I watch every week. Well, thank you, Betty. We sure appreciate you watching every week. Concerning your trees, um, it's, it's a little bit hard to have neglected them too much. Sometimes when peach trees are a little bit younger, that's really when they need to be trimmed for form, but most people do not trim their fruit trees as often as they should. So when it comes to pruning them, I brought in a, a sample of some incorrect pruning, and I'm going to hold up my paper again so that you can see this, but this is a case where people, someone has trimmed the branch, but they did not cut it back to a proper place. And you're not going to be able to see, but right here, Karen, can you hold that for me? And the I, branch of the Yeah, paper. just the paper. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then I, there you go. Uh, right in here is a bud. So the, there's really about this much that sh is left behind. So they should have cut it back a little more towards the bud, or they should have cut back here to a branch. So what you don't want to leave are these stubs that you see here. And here's an example of what happens if you leave the stub on the same branch. Here is a stub that was left, and you can see that the bark is starting to fall off, it's blackening, and it's dead, and those do not ever grow out. So that's why you don't want to leave stubs. This really ought to be pruned off right here so that this particular area um, doesn't get decay into the, the tree or anything bad happens to it. it. It's probably not the serious, but it's not the best way to do it. So when it comes to trimming your tree, uh, Always trim the dead tree, the dead wood out first, and you have been doing that, so that's fantastic. And then if you need to thin it out, uh, if you've got any uh, water sprouts coming up from uh, up in the tree, branches from last year, uh, where where they may grow, am I okay? I have straight up. That's called a water sprout. All those need to come off, and that's very common on uh, fruit trees, crab apples, anything in the in the prunus uh, cherry family. And the other thing that you want to do is anything coming up from the base of the trunk are called uh, suckers, and those need to be trimmed off. 
So once you've trimmed out your dead wood, once you've trimmed out your water sprouts and your suckers down at the base, then any branches that are kind of crossing over one another, you need to kind of cut one of them off so it's gone, and then you've got one branch instead of the two rubbing against each other. And that's, that's really the very basics of how to trim. That was very good. It's not yeah. that easy to give pruning basics, <laughs> but that was good. Thank you, Dave. Sure. And now Karen. I have an email about uh, landscape replacement. And uh, the, the person didn't give their name, but they had a uh, pussy willow shrub that was quite overgrown. It's near our garage along the walkway to an entry. They're, they're going to cut it down, replace it with something else. Any suggestions? Well, looking at this picture, um, I'm not sure which way the exposure is, but this is a common problem a lot of people have with, with houses where the builders put the sidewalks where we can't have pretty beds along the buildings. Um, so this, this tree does look like it's, it's gotten some dead areas, so it's probably time to go. The problem you're going to have is that along that walkway that's so narrow, you don't really want to have anything taller than the person walking by it, you know, where their arms or where bags would be hitting it. So I wouldn't do anything like roses. I'm not sure how much sun that gets. So you might have to do some lower perennials or, or dwarf shrubs along there. Also think about verticality of maybe doing a trellis, a big one along there. Um, depending on how much sun or shade you get, there are some different clematis or climbing roses that would work out. But um, at least you have a little bit more room than me. My sidewalk to the garage is 18 inches. Um, so it, it is a tough little spot. But, but keep in mind, don't do anything like roses or something with thorns that would grab people because that is such a narrow area. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Okay, Ella. All righty. I have a, a question from a viewer about whether or not they need to clean up the old leaves from last fall in their perennial beds. So the important thing is, is I would say yes. It'll help to reduce slug damage. And this is a point where if you have some mulch down, you can lightly rake off until you hit, hit that mulch layer, or you can rake off the dead leaves and get a, um, and put down some new mulch. But it really does need a winter tidy up to uh, reduce insect problems, also any disease problems from the old foliage from last year. So spend some time on a nice weekend and get your beds cleaned up. I did that yesterday. And Excellent. boy, you can get some leaves so thick and wet. It, yeah. yeah, need to move those around. All right, I noticed that we have a strawberry question. And so I want to go to line five, and Ruth has a question for us. Hi, Ruth. Hi. Uh, I just planted uh, some strawberries this spring, and I uh, put them in a raised bed in the yard. Now, uh, I was told some people say you don't uh, you pull off the berries the first year, and some people say it doesn't matter. So my question is, uh, do I eat? let the strawberries go and eat them and then also i have i just it's not a question but i just wanted you to know that i have a it's a, i guess it's a thanksgiving cactus and i had over 200 blooms on that cactus mm. this year wow. and it is blooming again and i probably got right at 100 blooms on that cactus again wow yeah congratulations that is excellent <laughs> congratulations and eat those strawberries <laughs> i was going to say i always do i mean when i've done a couple beds uh -huh. why That's do you pick it. why would you pick them off i guess to <clears throat> well I, i've heard some rule of thought that letting it put more energy into the roots yeah. and developing but you know but they're gosh, so a strawberry good. is a strawberry <laughs> Yeah, I thought I was going to be doing it wrong, but I just decided, <laughs> hey, I'm making this executive decision. I'm going to eat those. So, yeah, you can. It didn't hurt my strawberry patch. I just divi I just divided 15 out of mine, and you can't even tell. Well, I think it's like with a lot of things. If, if the bed is good, you've got a good soil, mm -hmm. adequate moisture that first year, they're going to establish no matter what. Once okay. they get going, they don't stop. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, good. I feel I feel good about that. Well, say we have a ladybug question on line one. Hi there, Faye. Hello. Yes. What's your question? Well, I I, I don't like any kind of bug. I I, I don't want to tolerate it. And uh, I asked uh, some gardeners, what can I do about ladybugs? And they said 
uh, nothing. They didn't know what to do. But they're getting into my house and on my ceiling and on my bed. Okay, so we have a short time left. What That's would you right. folks tell her? Use your vacuum cleaner to suck them up and don't give any thought about them and don't use any insecticides inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're really not going to hurt you and they're not going to multiply indoors. They can't breed inside. Suck them up and um, I, or have your granddaughter come over and clean for you. Well, and that they're Asian lady beetles, technically. Yes. They're not the, the really beneficial ladybugs. They're just a nuisance. They're, they're not a problem and other than that. And the native ones would not be in our houses. Yes, These right. are the Asian ones. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for calling because a lot of people are going to have that same issue. Thank you three for being here. I appreciate thank the you. hair Enjoy nursery it. folks. We thank you for watching and we want to wish Nikki the best. Dang, we don't want you to leave. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.